assistant administrator and chief data officer for the agency and welcome to our session. I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce the three panelists that we have today and say a few words about ERS and then we'll get started. If you have questions, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom and we'll have about 15 minutes at the end of the session to go through the the questions. If you're having any trouble uh, with technical difficulties, you can go ahead and use the chat feature and uh, we'll get um, hopefully get those um, addressed for you. So we have three uh, panelists today. Uh, the first panelist is Andrew Saul, who is an economist in our markets and trade economics division. Andrew coordinates our ERS week outlook and has been in that role since June 2021 and is the author of the monthly We Outlook report that um, appears on our website. Our second panelist is AJ Turan, who's also with the Markets and Trade Economics Division as an economist. And AJ specializes in the dairy industry and is a co-author of the monthly Livestock, Dairy and Poultry Outlook report and has been in that role since February of 2021. And then finally, we have Matthew McLachlan, who is a research economist in our food economics division, and his research focuses on forecasting food prices, and he's been with ERS since 2015. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, for those who maybe weren't able to participate in the earlier session, I just wanted to briefly state uh, the mission for the Economic Research Service is to anticipate trends and emerging issues across the agricultural sector and rural America. And they, we do that by conducting high quality objective economic research. So we don't um, make policy decisions, rather we produce information that can be informed, can inform policy across both the public and private sector. We're one of the 13 federal statistical agencies, along with our sister agency, NAS, who's hosting this data users conference. And if we go to the next slide, please, Andrew. Um, and just to speak a little bit about some of those emerging issues that I mentioned in the previous slide, we have done a fair amount of work in the last year on the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ukraine conflict, infant formula shortage, and tax analysis. But what we're here this afternoon to talk to you about is uh, our wheat and dairy data, as well as work we've been doing on the food price outlook. And so with that, I will turn it over to Andrew to talk about the, uh, the wheat uh, dairy pro data product. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Sowell. I am the ERS Wheat Outlook Coordinator, as Kelly noted, and I'm here today to discuss ERS wheat data products. So a few big picture questions that this pre presentation addresses. What wheat data products do we have? What's covered in the data? Why is it important? And how do we access it? And note that through the course of this presentation, I'll be discussing three distinct data products. The first one is simply called wheat data. The next is our outlook tables. And lastly, I'll cover the by class quarterly spreadsheets. So as noted, the first data product I'll cover is what we just called the wheat data. You may hear references to historical yearbook tables for wheat. These are included in this data product as well. Um, and here is a view of the location on the website where one you can access these wheat data products. A few notes about this data set. It is the primary ERS wheat data set that most users will reference to obtain detailed by class and all wheat data. Data for this resource is gathered from a wide variety of sources, from NAS, from the WASD, um, from the PSD online, which stands for Production, Supply, and Distribution. And this is the database maintained by USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service, which covers global commodity, um, key commodities, supply and demand balances. We have data from the Ag Marketing Service and a lot of other sources as well. There are separate files for recent years only and others for uh, another file for, for the full historical data, depending on what the, you know, what your needs are. And it is updated the first workday after the WASD is published. So here's a few highlights of what's in this. It includes a total of 35 tables in each file, a brief rundown of the data included. There's area planted, harvested and production by class. There's world production, supply and disappearance. And note that disappearance is a term we use that encompasses all forms of use. Consider it a proxy for consumption or consumption and trade. Um, US supply and disappearance, total and by class. And food use, monthly data, all wheat and Durham. US and international prices. We have monthly US trade data by component, which breaks out grain, flour, and products. 
we have all wheat and Durham in, that, in those tables. We have US exports by destination, flour production, consumption, and other related data. And then we have some tables that give the monthly trade data for all five classes. So this data source is an easy reference to a wide variety of data, which you would otherwise need to dig through multiple websites to find. Some pieces of information are uniquely available in this data source, such as the monthly by class trade data and monthly food use. This data gives us a perspective into the analytical methods that are used to calculate the WASD figures. Note that for various analytical questions, there is a documentation page available on the ERS website for this resource. And that'll cover a lot of the background questions that you may have. Um, a few comments on improvements that have been made to this data over time. Well, uh, soft white maximum 10.5% protein quote was added into the table 19. This quote was added because the previous quote, which was for ordinary protein, was not being reported by AMS anymore. If reporting on that quote is reestablished, then we'll continue to publish both of them. Improvements in automating data gathering. Uh, this saves time and preparation and also should improve the data validation for the product. Um, visualization and progress. So we have a visualization that we're working on to bring data elements to life. So the idea is, well, we'll take a look at it shortly, but the idea is to take the data that's already in the tables and give users abilities to, to look at it in different ways. Uh, publication date is not yet set on that. We have long-term goals to continually improve Section 508 compliance for these data products, which includes enhanced accessibility of the product to users with disabilities. So here we have a view of the upcoming wheat visualization, which transforms our existing data tables into adaptive charts. So this first chart takes the by class data, which is in tables 34 to 35, and allows the user to view it in a few different ways, either monthly or quarterly or marketing year totals. Uh, what's currently on the screen is monthly totals, uh, bear in, bearing in mind that the marketing year for wheat is June through May. Adaptive summary tables are also available in the product. So this table gives a view of the by class trade over time and the 21-22 marketing year, June through May is highlighted. This was a very low export year for the United States. We see here in the green bars for white wheat and, uh, and, and the hard, hard red spring, which is orange, these two bars are very small this year uh, because in 21-22, both of those classes experienced significant drought in major production areas. Now those classes are seen recovering in 22-23, while HRW exports, that's hard red winter seen in red, um, start to become tighter in the new year. So this visualization has the capability to chart different price series against one another. So here we're looking at dark northern spring, which is a subclass of hard red spring compared to hard red winter. So notably in late 2021 and early 2022, uh, we see that the higher protein hard red spring was substantially higher in price due to its relative scarcity. This marketing year, the situation is reversed with the HRS crop having recovered from last year, but drought has now hit hard red winter supplies, resulting in the two classes being nearly equal in price. This is historically unusual, given that higher protein classes like HRS would normally be at a premium. Another prominent feature evident in this chart is high prices in general. Uh, earlier this year, prices surged to multi-year highs at the start of the Ukraine-Russia conflict with added support from persistent dryness in US HRW production zones. Uh, prices subsided in recent months with key North American harvests being collected and Ukraine shipments being enabled via the corridor. Um, however, wheat prices remain elevated, generally speaking, compared to historical norms. Similar methodology can be used to compare select FOB FOB, which is freight on board, basically export quotations. In this slide, we have charted Australian soft white and US soft red winter. Although these may not be generally the most direct competitors for one another, it's noteworthy to see that these prices do tend to track one another somewhat closely over time. 
This visual can also create maps such as this one for US exports to key destinations by marketing year. Here we see that in 21-22, the largest destination for US wheat was Mexico, followed by the Philippines and Japan. This is really just a snapshot, but with this tool, users can toggle from year to year and we'll be able to see as certain export markets grow or shrink over time. So it's particularly interesting for countries like Brazil, China, Nigeria, where our exports have been variable over time. Um, lastly, I'll provide a visual of by-class wheat production. One of the key features of this chart is the general downtrend in US production over time which is mainly a function of gradually declining area across, across the major classes, but it's particularly notable for hard red winter and hard red spring. Now, moving on to discuss a second distinct data product, the wheat outlook tables. Now these are available alongside the, out, the outlook report on the ERS website. And they're also available alongside the historical reports on the Cornell library site. A quick explanation of these tables. With only eight separate tables in the file, they are an abbreviated version of the larger wheat data product. They contain all wheat and by class supply and disappearance data, quarterly supply and disappearance, and monthly food use, as well as price data and some recent US trade data. These tables are published at the same time as the Wheat Outlook article, which is two work days after WASD. They're useful as a quick reference, although not intended to be as comprehensive in terms of historic data. But generally speaking, they're a good companion piece to the Outlook publication. The third distinct wheat data product that I'll cover today is the wheat by class quarterly sheet. Now this is available on the wheat data webpage. It's generally updated four times per year, February, May, August, and November. An improvement we've made to this product has been disseminating the data more regularly throughout the year as the quarterly data is, is finalized. Data is provided for quarters that, are, that already are completed with no additional forecasting beyond that data. The timing of release is driven by the publication of USDA's NAS flour milling data, which contributes to our food use calculation. So once that data is included, uh, along with the stocks that come out slightly before, uh, we're able to we're able to um, update a quarter of data on this. So this is a unique product published by ERS. Quarterly all wheat and marketing year by class data uh, match the WASD database, but with the added layers of detail, this product gives more perspective into the market. Note that the product was previously named historical data, but the name was expanded to historical by class quarterly data to provide a better explanation of what the data is. So here's a view of two quarters of by class quarterly data. This is just a sample of what it looks like. The spreadsheet itself doesn't have any visuals built in, but it does allow analysts to dig into the figures at a more detailed level. One interesting point that users could analyze through this data is by class quarterly food use. And similarly, seed use by class can be distinguished for each quarter as well. Um, seed use patterns vary notably throughout the year among the different classes. And in the text of the latest Sweet Outlook, we noted that hard red spring seed usage was distributed among quarters differently than, than usual due to planning delays. This isn't all explained on the screen here, but users could use the data at this source to explain, to see that this larger than normal proportion occurred in the first quarter of this marketing year with a smaller than normal proportion in the fourth quarter last year. And that's due to planting delays in those regions. Uh, that particular layer of analysis is only available in this particular source. But this is just a few small points in the grand scheme of this data set. I think it's noteworthy that this data set goes all the way back to 1973-74. Um, I thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussion. Uh, but for now, I will pass along the conversation to AJ. Great, thank you. And I was just actually going to ask, do you want to just continue sharing your slides since that screen was already open? Uh, uh, yeah, sure, I can do there. that. Uh -huh. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so we'll now turn um, over to AJ, who will talk about our uh, dairy data. Just give us one minute to, great, thank you very much. Thank you, Andy.
AJ, I believe you're uh, muted. If you could unmute yourself, please. Apologies for that. Okay, do you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about ERS data, data sets. Um, there are currently 12 uh, data data sets, uh, which are a series of data table, mainly uh, spreadsheets as you can see in the figure. Um, and we cover uh, domestic supply for milk and dairy products. We calculate the domestic use per capita consumption, um, factor affecting milk production, international trading, uh, among others. Uh, some, the, the monthly uh, set are, are mainly published one day after was. Uh, the first one I am going to talk about is uh, the milk cows um, production by state and region. And this uh, product, this product is an animal product. Um, it is an animal product that data that five years provide regional subtotal for, for milk cows. Uh, milk per cow and milk production from, from states with data provided by, by NAS. And the beauty of this chart is that we present uh, the percentage of the total milk production in the United States um, and how much uh, we present the state um, based on the total uh, national production. Uh, some of of us now, the West and Midwest are the largest largest uh, milk producer. And um, as you can see there, there's a map with the different federal marketing or order uh, regulated by AMS. Um, so milk production is provided by different federal marketing order or FMAOs. Uh, we also gather gather information from the other states that are not regulated uh, by AMS, such uh, as Virginia, for example, and, and New York. Um, if, you, if you don't log, download the, the file, you will see that California and, and Wisconsin, which are in the West and, and Midwest, respectively, are the main state producer of milk. Our next uh, set is United States milk production and related data. It's a quarterly and annual uh, set. It's very sim simplistic. Uh, we show their uh, quarterly milk production data. Uh, also, we calculate a proxy for dairy feed uh, prices and replacement cow prices. And related with the product, product we have the following product that is an annual one, the annual, annual spreadsheet, um, annual meat production and factor affecting supply. Uh, and the report includes uh, this annual table get more detail uh, about factor affecting milk production. Uh, as you see here, we show the inventory of cows and replacements and their productivity. Also, we show uh, the relation of milk price paid to the farmer versus, versus their cost of feeding uh, those cows. That is uh, the milk feed uh, ratio. Also, we show uh, cows price and slaughter prices um, as a complement in the right uh, column of the, of the chart. Another product we have, well, pardon me, this is, I wanted to show um, a trend that we have uh, 
you know, we plot in a, a plotting or making a graph from the information we have before. Uh, as you can see from the previous table, we can see a general trend and is that farm milk production is steadily increasing each year. Uh, we also can see a decline in the number of cows from, from the 80s to uh, around 2004. And then a slow increase after that year. So the bottom line I want to present here is that cow has been becoming more productive every, every year as farmers get more efficient with new technologies and improvement on cow's genetics. And all this driven by an increase in demand for milk, particularly and skin solids. So the next is um, supply and utilization for dairy products categories. Um, this is a monthly and annual publication. Um, the main objective uh, or purpose of this table is to get the domestic human consumption of milk and dairy products. Uh, here we calculate the total supply and domestic use, which is a proxy for consumption for the main eight uh, dairy products out, outside class one or bottle milk, bottle milk or fluid milk and class two that is soft products. This, pro this product being a uh, um, butter, dry skin milk, American cheese, other than American cheese, dry whey, whey protein concentrate, lactose and canned uh, milk. And we use the following uh, formula is very simple. Uh, can you go back, uh, Kelly? We use a total supply that is beginning, beginning, beginning stocks plus production plus import. Then we calculate domestic disappear, which is total commercial supplies, less export, less ending stocks. You can go to the next one. Okay, the next product is uh, supply and utilization of, of milk in all, in all products. Uh, this is also a monthly, monthly and annual pro, uh, publication. We convert dairy products to milk equivalents based on their fat and skin solid, solid proportion and the composition of the milk during that period that we are analyzing, which, by the way, uh, change uh, for in each cow, each day, each week, month, each season. So by doing this, we get uh, the domestic use for all the meal use to produce all dairy products. And the formula is basically the same as the previous one. The only thing we add milk marketing, which is milk production, less farm use, um, and basically that, that's it. And the annual adjustment to get more in the, you know, to be, be more um, detailed about for human, we, we take that domestic disappearance and subtract any domestic farm use or farm, any farm use or shipment to Puerto Rico and Virgin Island or anything that has been used for, for animal use. So the next one. <clears throat> okay, the next one is, is a big table, very detailed, very, very good uh, table, but to show, to show you that table, it's very hard to see it. So with information, um, I'm going to, I'm going to show a graph with that information. Um, so as you saw in the last table, we, uh, we calculate domestic use. So with, with that information, we can get animal per capita consum consumption, which is another data set. Um, for most product per, ca per capita consumption is calculated by dividing that domestic disappearance by the resident po population, 
plus arm, armored fo forces overseas. And that exception is class one. As reported by the US uh, Bu uh, Bureau of the of Census. Since, okay, so as you see in the table, uh, you can see a decline in the consumption of fluid milk, but you can see a rise in, in consumption of, of cheese. So in other words, we are referring to eat that milk converted in, in cheese instead of drinking it as we did it in, in the past. Also, is uh, you can see uh, ice cream is decreasing a little bit, um, and jo yogurt is increasing. So there's a very interesting. If you can go there, you can go below and make make the graph, and you can see those trends. So next, um, this is um, the same graph, but we we uh, we can convert this product in, in milk equivalent. Uh, and, and you can see that by converting the previous chart in milk equivalent, we can see the following consumption pattern. We have consuming more milk fat each, each year, while skin solid has been mainly steady. So uh, another product we have is annual fluid uh, beverage milk sales quantity by products. Again, the table is very, very hard to see. So basically we, e ERS report annual estimate, estimated US sales quantities of fluid milk from the federal marketing orders areas and outside this area being New York, Virginia, Montana, and Maine, uh, we have sale for whole milk, fluid, uh, reduced fat, low fat fluid, skim milk fluid, flavored milk, flavored other than whole, butter milk, and eggnog, which is a favorite one at the, for this time of the year. Another, another product we have um, is annual selected soft dairy products, the domestic use for those products. This is class two, basically. Um, and we calculate those domestic use for regular ice cream, low, uh, low fat ice cream, non fat ice cream, frozen yogurt, sh shredded, I don't know, I pronounce that well, um, cottage cheese, butter, buttermilk, and sour cream. And for you can see in the graph for the past 20 years, consumption of regular ice cream has been uh, declining. But low fat ice cream is mainly flat, you can say. Um, sour cream and yogurt are, are up. Uh, we have been eating more yogurt than regular ice cream in the, in the past six years, which is very interesting. So next, um, we have American per capita consumption on selected Cheese by, by, by uh, types, uh, um, those types being American type, mainly uh, cheddar cheese, Italian type, mainly mozzarella, Swiss cheese, blue cheese, brick, Hispanic cheese, processed cheese, uh, processed cheese can be classified as uh, American cheese, and other types. And you can see in the graph, uh, Cheddar cheese and mozzarella are the most uh, consumed uh, cheese in, in the United States, but, but competing for that first place in the, in the past three or four years. Uh, in third place is Swiss cheese, which has been declining in the past two decades, but is gaining some territory in, in 2021. So the next set, and basically, this is my final set to present. Uh, is the daily situation at a glance? Um, the table is much bigger than that. This is a snapshot from the first part of the table. Um, but we provide basic daily 
daily related statistics uh, for the past four, 14 months and annual statistics for the past two years. And we cover um, farm production, farm gate prices, wholesale prices for dairy products, and year over year changes in the consumer price index of dairy products, uh, production of dairy products, stocks, beginning and ending stocks, export, import, and international prices. And uh, in the graph, you can see the year over year change in customer price in the for all items. Uh, this is re recently in, in October updated, updated as October. And you can see all daily products are above the average for, for the customer price in this for all products, um, mainly butter. So another interesting, you know, trend that you can see. Um, so a reference, what we use to produce this. Well, as you can see in the slide, um, ERS economists use uh, numerous primary sources to assemble and calculate data provided on the e ERS data, data web page, and those are uh, USDA Agricultural Americans Marketing Service, mainly for federal order statistics, and dairy market news that they provide prices for domestic, regional, and international prices. Um, we have, uh, obviously, USDA and National Statistics Service, they provide a lot of information. The bulk of information is from their, their server and their publication. We also have um, agricultural, a uh, foreign agricultural service, mainly for trading. Also, the Department of Commerce, uh, Census Bureau, Bureau for uh, trading, and um, for customer price index and anything related with retail prices for daily. Uh, that the Bureau of State of Labor study. So, in conclusion. Well, I'm going to summarize my presentation by saying uh, what is the information we provide with data, data sets are a series of data tables, spreadsheet covering domestic supply, demand factor affecting milk production, um, per capita consumption. Why it is important what well, keep track of total supply and demand of milk and dairy products and also shows recent and historical per capita consumption on, on daily products. How can it be used? Well, this, these uh, products are, can be down, downloaded and used to, to graph trends for business strategies and for forecasts or for any other thing you want to, to do with them. Where can I find them? Uh, for all detailed documentation I presented, we have, uh, please visit ERS daily data set, uh, daily data webpage. And we have documentation and very detailed. And I am encourage you to visit us and, and see what we have. So thank you, that's my presentation. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, AJ. And uh, next we will turn to Matt McLaughlin who will talk about forecasting food prices. So Matt, the floor is yeah. yours. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Andrew, is it easier if I just uh, tell you to uh, see the slides or should I request control? Whatever works for you. Okay. Um, All right, that doesn't seem to work. So I'm just gonna cue you when I'm ready for the next slide. Um, hi, uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm Matt McLaughlin. I work in our food economics division at ERS. Uh, for the past two years, I've been working on issues of food price inflation and food price forecasting. Before that, I worked in AJ's branch, uh, looking at livestock uh, markets a little more closely. We'll, we'll touch on both of those. Um, markets during this presentation. So uh, hopefully my background helps with that. Um, Andrew, uh, please proceed to the next slide. Oh. 
Looks like we might have jumped to the end, Andrew, on those slides. I, I don't think that's not at the end, is it? It's, it's slide 42 is what it says. But I just, I think okay. I just gave Matthew advanced, control. I think, oh, okay. I was gonna say advance to the next slide. There we go. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, here's a brief overview of, of the food price outlook as you probably gathered from Andrew and AJ's presentations. A lot of these data products have a lot of moving parts. I only have a few minutes to talk to you guys today. So I will give you a very brief overview of the food, food price outlook, the data products we provide, uh, visualizations, and as well as analysis. And then we'll jump into some newer developments uh, that have uh, come out and will proceed for the next few months. So first, it's important to note that these data are gathered from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Specifically, they provide consumer and producer price uh, indices on a variety of food categories, as well as agricultural market categories that allow us to, uh, in a nationally representative way, represent how food prices have changed in percentage terms from year to year over a long time horizon. So we at ERS uh, specifically track two, uh, 22 retail food categories, as well as 13 farm level and wholesale level agricultural and food commodities. And you can see on the right here in the first figure, we are going to report some of the data uh, from BLS. We essentially curate uh, and process this data for the relevant categories, including things like relative importance, which means how much of a consume, the average consumer's uh, food basket or whatever they consume, uh, how much is represented by each of these food categories. And you can see here, for example, Food at home represents about 62, whereas food away from home represents about 38% of purchases. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, uh, various measures that capture in part uh, recent inflation with our month, month changes, as well as annual inflation with our look at a 12 month change and comparing all of this year to all of the previous year. For context, we provide things like annual measures of inflation for the past few years. On the far right, we're going to get to where our largest value add is, and this is by providing forecast ranges. Uh, reported right there are our legacy forecast ranges. These are one percentage points uh, for retail food categories and three percentage points for farm level commodities as well as wholesale prices. Now, uh, these forecasts are going to be provided at the annual level. Um, these are often used by some of our sister agencies from around the USDA, um, including places like FNS. So annualized measures of inflation are oftentimes the most useful. So we provide uh, forecasts of food price infl inflation for the current year, for which we have not observed the full set of food prices. For example, right now we have data through October but we have not observed yet November and December. We will also start producing uh, inflation forecasts for the following year starting in July. So right now we're forecasting both for the rest of 2022 as well as 2023. Uh, this is one of ERS's most viewed products and it's viewed by a diverse audience. So we have um, consumers from government, from academia, the general public industry, so we have to have um, visualizations and other ways of conveying information that appeal to a really, really wide audience. And here on the right is one of those representations. Uh, here, this puts in context the amount of expenditures that go to food relative to other categories uh, in a given year. So here we have the food expenditure series for 2022. And we can see food is the third largest category behind housing and transportation. This helps. Uh, folks who are interested in our products really put it in context. The prices change. How much does this affect a household's budget? All right. And so I'm just going to touch on this lightly. We have a uh, set of uh, charts of note, uh, Amber Waves articles. These are short pieces that provide visualizations along with a short piece of text that oftentimes provide information on topical questions. Um, here we have a recent one from my colleague, Megan Swicer, who showed how uh, the price of a cup of coffee might've changed between 
2021 and 2022 for the average consumer. Uh, also to augment this, we have summary findings. This is one of our most heavily uh, consumed products. This provides very brief descriptions of, and oftentimes we draw from our colleagues over at MTED as to why ag, commo ag commodity, uh, wholesale food or retail food prices have changed, providing some causal explanations as to why we're seeing the trends that we're seeing uh, in the current period. Oftentimes the data in here is not new, but it conveys uh, the information in a way that may resonate better with our audiences. All right, again, so who consumes our products? We have, uh, we receive requests, uh, interests, questions from a wide variety of folks. Uh, we were contacted approximately uh, 40 times to provide various bits of information from other agencies last year, uh, my team between Megan and I. Uh, some of the main folks who we um, correspond with frequently are the folks who put together uh, prices for our, uh, the Thrifty Food Plan, which helps to inform SNAP. Uh, we get requests from places like OECD, FAO, and, and USDA leadership. Okay, so here, that's a bit of background on the food price outlook. Here's what's changed. So in August, we released a report that provided a revised approach to forecasting food prices. It's provided methodological updates that um, at least historically looking back, we found reduced forecast error and provide more reliable um, and reasonable measures of uncertainty. So the previous approaches uh, use trends at farm or wholesale or energy level prices they had some measures of ad hoc seasonality, long terms, and lags. And again, they represent uncertainty with either one or three percentage point dams. We took their approaches as a starting point uh, and really made some big steps, uh, at least in my opinion, in the right direction to get at uh, a more uh, precise and um, updatable version of a forecasting modeling system. So the first thing we did was to select the structure of each model based on how well those models fit the data. And you can see here um, in, on the right, we have a comparison of our new, um, our new measures, our new forecasting measures with the old measures. So we just had a one percentage point range, no midpoint. Uh, that's represented in orange. In contrast, in blue, we have a median uh, forecast as well as an upper and lower bound based on um, the part of the data that our model does not explain very well. And we can see in 2020, a year that where it was very hard to guess prices for dairy, we had a convergence towards the actual measure of inflation much more rapidly and stayed much closer to the actual level of inflation throughout uh, the forecasting interval. Uh, it eliminates the need for expert opinion. Previous me measures would consult folks uh, throughout USDA about forecasts. Here we can, we can generate more uh, precise estimates just leaning on um, statistical techniques. We now have data-driven measures of uncertainty. Monte Carlo simulations are used to generate these prediction intervals, which narrow over time rather than just using a single percentage point throughout the year. It's re uh, replicable and uh, transferable among staff. This is automatic code. Uh, if two people, if expert opinions included, if two people are have differences of opinions, this can be reflected in forecasts. And then lastly, automation saves time. We pull all the data and we do all the processing uh, automatically. Now, the other thing we can do very quickly is uh, the food price or the food price environment and the food systems really changed during COVID. So we may become interested in some of these food price series that we hadn't historically tracked. An example of this is we have the um, uh, uh, 
food away from home is split up into six different categories. So it's comprised of six different categories. On the right here, uh, without much uh, in terms of um, new machinery or anything like that, we could look at a very specific category, which is limited service for food away from home and provide reasonable forecasts on the fly. So this was 2020, a period when food away from home consumption really changed very rapidly within um, the United States as well as internationally. And we can see here that we have a forecast that by May comes very, very close to the actual level of inflation for the specific category of food away from home. And uh, what this allows us is to provide different and more detailed measure of food price changes over time. If the data is available, either from BLS or other sources, we can start incorporating this information in a standardized and practical way. Lastly, this is not my graph. I borrowed it from a colleague, Michael Lajimian. Uh, we can be sensitive to new changes in information, changes in industry structure, that are important for forecasting. Uh, this is a messy graph. I would probably represent it a little differently, but I think what really jumps out to us is if we consider all the drivers of the food price inflation, we can see here this large purple patch between 21 and 22 represents uh, the part of food price increases that are attributable to increases in the money supply. That's not something we currently consider in our forecast, we can take the information that's coming out of uh, academia and consider it uh, relatively rapidly using a standardized approach. If it doesn't help our forecast, we don't uh, necessarily have to use it, but we can at least in a very standard way consider each of these. Um, also what's changing, our, our friends over at the Food Dollar uh, take a real uh, intensive look at how much of uh, total food costs are attributable to different steps along the supply chain. We're not seeing for all, com for all commodities, we're not necessarily seeing a very close link between ag commodity prices and retail prices. There's just a lot of costs that uh, go into food prices and ag commodities for, not for every food, but for a lot of foods, just do not represent a very large fraction of this overall cost. So we can revisit some of these old assumptions that things like agricultural prices are passed through. They may be correct, but it's worth evaluating them again as the food price systems change. And uh, again, with standardized approaches, shareable code, we can really start partner, or we can really effectively partner with outside collaborators in a way that's uh, straightforward, easy, and improves our modeling uh, capabilities as rapidly as possible. And with that, I think I'm at about time, so I am going to stop there and I think we are up for any questions. Great, thank, thank you very much, Ahmad, and as well to AJ and Andrew, if you could perhaps stop sharing the screen and then we'll have uh, all the presenters. Um, there we go, um, would be great. So um, we did have one question that was answered uh, in, in the chat um, with respect to a, lo a link to the ERS wheat data. So thank you, Molly, uh, for prevent, providing that information. Um, it's in, it, I believe you should be able to see the Q&A. If you can't, let us know again. Uh, the next question is also for Andrew from Chris Eggerman. How do you allocate food use among classes of wheat? So great question, Chris. Uh, we have, um, so the basic allocation is, as you may know, uh, the tables provide the, um, the, the food use for all wheat and durum. And so the question is, how do we allocate the other four classes? And basically it comes down to expert judgment on a quarterly basis. And it's a combination of, um, you know, having some having some industry contacts that we check against as, as well as our own research into price differentials and what we think is happening in the market with that regard. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't see other questions in, in the uh, chat or the Q&A right now, but please go ahead and, uh, and enter your questions if you have them for any of the presenters or uh, for ERS in general. We're happy to take, to take those questions. I'll just uh, give it a few minutes to see if folks are, would like to formulate their, their questions that they would ask, like to ask.
Okay, well, uh, if there are no further questions, um, we, we only have a few minutes left in, this, in the session anyway, um, but I would like to uh, thank our presenters for taking the time to put the information together and share it uh, with those of you on the line, as well as to thank you for joining this ERS breakout session. It's very important to us that we're as transparent and forthcoming with the information that we have, and we'd like to take the opportunity in these uh, data user meetings to highlight some of the specific data that we think might be of use or interest to those in the public. So we always take suggestions about what you would like to hear more of. We'll be doing a breakout session likely in these at the spring data users meeting in uh, Omaha, which is in April. Um, and then I just uh, wanted to note from NAS a comment that you'll be receiving a survey evaluation survey from Marissa Ruber, who's been organizing this meeting. You'll receive an evaluation survey. We encourage you to complete that because it allows us to continually improve upon these particular meetings. So with that, thank you very much to all of you for joining and I hope you have a nice afternoon. Alrighty, everyone, you have a good evening. Thank you.